Katie Milkman, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I really am so impressed with this book, um, How to Change. It's such a, like, a simple and like bold claim. Um, Thank you. And the first thing I noticed about it and about kind of hearing you talk on other podcasts and reading your bio is that you, you kind of approach human behavior like an engineering challenge. And on the one hand, I was like, yeah, like that makes a lot of sense. And on the other hand, like when I think about the, the changes that people want to make, the changes that I want to make and that I'm struggling with and that I might buy, to buy a book to help me with, I can feel like all this shame. And like humans are so like, gooey and noodly and messy, and you're coming at it as an engineer. I'm curious, um, like, how, how you approach people as you know, to say this is an engineering problem, it's not a, a an ooey gooey self problem, you know? Yeah, no, it's a really interesting question. And of course, the self help genre is filled of, with um, approaching it as an ooey gooey problem. And one of the challenges with positioning this book, I will just say is that, you know, it's a book about science written by someone with an engineering background that's trying to approach an ooey gooey problem. And so it, it's like, you know, a lot of heads explode. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, I, I think most people, once, once we start talking about the evidence, get excited about the potential to treat this differently and to recognize that data can be brought to bear and that um, scientific solutions are available that can solve an ooey gooey problem, even our ooeyest gooeyest problems. Um, there's, you know, ways that data can help and there's ways that science can help address them. So that's kind of how I talk about it. And like the proof is in the pudding because we have all of this research evidence now, this huge body of, of work showing how effective it can be to use tools from science to tackle the ooey gooey stuff. Mm. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, I'm um, part of what I do is a sort of a health and behavior coach. And so I always like to bring science into it. And there's, there's a way in which people will like, like read the book and then still not implement. Sure. Right. So like, is there, do you find there are science solutions to that? Or is it at some point is, are, are we dealing with just sort of, you know, the gray ware that we don't, we don't really know how to handle. I think there are. So one of the key lessons of the book um, actually is that like just giving people information doesn't change their behavior. And then, right, I wrote a book which gives you a bunch of information about how to change your behavior. So like, what am I, what do I think? Like, what do I actually believe? Will this help anyone? Um, I, I do believe that educational evidence is really strong, right? Like you can learn calculus and then do calculus. We know that. And so there to my mind, um, it's, it's quite different to tell you it's bad to smoke or um, that it's important to exercise or that you should save more for retirement and then to tell you how to do that and how to overcome the barrier. So I, I'm hopeful, but it's funny because I'd love to see a randomized controlled trial of whether this book actually helps anyone <laughs> change um, or whether just giving the tools isn't enough. I'm, I'm hopeful that the insights about oneself and like the what are the barriers to change that you're going to need to overcome? And what are the proven tactics is a really different kind of information than we normally give people. But it's certainly true that for some people that won't be enough. And then you can start thinking like really seriously about things like paternalism, right? So should there be more paternalistic policies around really big societal challenges? And of course, we're talking right now when a major societal challenge has to do with getting everyone vaccinated. So you know, how aggressive should we get with things like mandates? Those are the kinds of questions I think that start arising around all aspects of um, self-improvement, if you will, uh, when you really look at people who know it would be better for them, but aren't getting anywhere. Like, should we, should we incentivize it? Should we create mandates? How do we go about doing this in a way that's best for society and individuals? Right. I have a question that I wrote down that I that's way, way down on my list, but I kind of want to ask it now, which is so you know you're you're dealing with the science of personal individual behavior change, and yet you're very much embedded in the nudge community. You know, Cass Sunstein, Richard Thaler, the this whole idea of policy and what you know mandate. And then I've heard you talk recently about the one line that helps more people get vaccinated. Um, but the, the question is like, let's let's say you were given absolute power over our education system 
And so you could take kids at very young and teach them useful stuff that would help them lead for happy, productive, self-fulfilling lives. I'm curious what, you know, given that kind of, you don't need to nudge them. You, like you just give them the basic human blueprint based on what you've learned as a social scientist and as an engineer. Like what, what are some of the top things you would teach kids? What a fun question. First of all, I do not think anyone should give me that job because there are better qualified individuals to do it. So, but it's a really interesting fantasy. Like, could I, get, could I come up with things that are useful? I do think giving people a better understanding of their own limitations would be incredibly valuable. One of the th things I write about in the book is the idea, and this is not my idea, this is um, from research by um, Matthew Rabin of Harvard and Ted O'Donohue of Cornell, that people are on average, not super aware of their own limitations. They talk about the idea that some people are, they call it sophisticated, which is sort of a, anyway, you, we could take, we could take offense at that term if we want, but let's just set that aside for now. Some people are, are sophisticated, meaning they understand their own limitations and others are more naive and think, you know, okay, yeah, I fell on my face or I procrastinated last time, but next time I'm going to have this. Um, I think trying to teach more people about our limits and, and not teach it in a threatening way, but rather just look, this is part of being human. There are these features of human nature that our habits really matter. Um, we take the path of least resistance. We uh, tend to be impulsive. <laughs> we tend to look for fresh start moments to make change. And with, without those, we are particularly inertial, um, that confidence matters and a lot of us lack it. So once we understand those things about ourselves, I think if kids learn that at an earlier age, they might be more open to change. And I am by far no expert on mental health. I, I really know almost nothing about it. So I'm about to like really do a dangerous thing and weave into a lane that isn't mine. But just looking at the conversation around some of the female athletes this summer who are having, um, you know, really opening the door to talk about that. I think, I think it's a related issue because, um, like some of the stigma around mental health problems is also related to the, the fact that we aren't raised thinking about ourselves as fallible and about that just as being a feature, not a bug. And that mm -hmm. um, like the, the best way to handle it is to understand the limitations we have and then use all the tools at our disposal to just be as good as you can be within those constraints. So I think if I were you know, there's some specific tools we've been, we've been, we're talking at a high level right now. There's some specific tools that I'm sure we'll get to in this conversation that I would want to teach kids that might help with these specific issues. But the biggest thing I'd want to leave them with is a knowledge and appreciation that, you know, we're just not perfect. We're not meant to be, and to expect to be is ridiculous. Um, and the right way to think about change and improvement is to understand that, Every single one of us has these limitations. Every single one of us is fighting an uphill battle when it comes to self-control, when it comes to confidence, when it comes to, um, you know, habits and so on. And like, just own that. And then you can make more progress. I love that so much because for, for me, like I, I started with like the big, the big emotion that I, that people come to me with is the albatross on their backs is, is shame. And shame for me is about being different, separate, alone, unlovable. And you're saying like the antidote to that at some level is we all acknowledge that we're all fallible, human, we're all in the same boat. And, and it's, it's not like religion hasn't pointed this out, by the way, like I, I don't wanna say, I'm, right? We, there's a lot, there's a lot of, um, thinking and writing that has been done about this for thousands of years. And yet it isn't part of the canon that we teach kids in schools and sort of the science part of it, the scientific support for it and what that means. Yeah. And it's really, I don't think part of our secular conversation. I mean, just take a look. So you're um, a collaborator with Angela Duckworth, who's most famous for grit, which has been so misrepresented in the popular press. Um, you know, I'm trying, yes. I've, I've spent some years trying to parse out like what her contributions were and what the, and I think like, there's like, she's been really pretty, pretty good about not, you know, going over her skis and, and kind of saying what the limitations are of the research and not overhyping it. But in the meantime, it's, it's, you know, the idea of grit in our culture is kind of antith antithetical to this idea of we are fallible. And, you know, it's almost like, you know, buck up, 
or, you know, you don't deserve anything. Right. And uh, let me just say, I, you know, I work very closely with Angela. She's probably my closest friend uh, as well. And I, I feel a hundred percent confident in stating for her that she would, she would not agree with that message at all. Uh, we co-founded this center together at, at Penn at Wharton, um, the behavior change for good initiative to explore how can we help people make better decisions? How can we help them change their behavior for good? Because she feels that's such an important question, knowing the limits of human nature. So, you know, she would not, she would not say grit is a trade and you better buck up. And she would, she would say, we need to understand our limits and, and solve them. And I was lucky to have a rate afford for this book. In fact, where that's sort of the key message. Right, right. It's just this idea that you know you have her point out that what looks like self-control is actually just people who've really nailed habits. Right. This is her research with um, Brian Gallo, one of her former PhD students, now a professor at um, University of Pittsburgh. That I think it's such an important insight they they have or point out is that we think other people are are exerting this tremendous self-control when they you know go to the gym regularly eat healthy you know meditate what pick pick the habit that looks so great but in fact it's it's about habit not self-control strength that's driving the people to achieve more in these um, in their research um, so before we get to the actual stuff itself I have one one more sort of meta question which is so what one of like psychology in general has been undergoing this you know replication crisis mm. for a while yes. um there's a lot of more um understanding now about the the weird populations right western educated industrialized rich and democratic and how we tend to be the outliers even though like you know that's so so much social science and psychology is based on understanding what like 20 year olds will do to get pizza in, in terms of like, who's, you know, and I, you know, when I got my PhD, it was like, who am I going to study? I'm going to study the people that I can study. <laughs> that mm -hmm. I, I don't have to take the bus. I don't, you know, so there's these, um, um, you know, cohorts of, uh, of just convenience. How sure are you about like the findings in the book in terms of how robust they are and how, how generalizable they are? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's a lot of different pieces to respond to there. First, um, I, I did do, you know, I, I tried very hard to focus on research that I believe was done using the best possible methods and that I, if I had to place a bet, I would expect will replicate. Um, however, I'm sure that there are some studies that I've cited that aren't perfect. And that, and another thing that I try to point out in the book is, um, there's a lot of boundary conditions, right? So something may work in one setting and not in another, and we're starting to understand what, you know, scientists call these moderators. What are the features of the context that shape whether this is a positive or a negative force? Like we haven't talked yet about fresh starts. So the idea that there are certain moments when we're more motivated to change, but I talk about the fact that actually the same kinds of moments that can be motivating for change and helpful if we're in a rut are actually harmful when we are um, on a path to success. So that's a whole other related issue. And sometimes I think gets mixed up in replication crisis debates. Is it that it doesn't replicate or that there some of these things we're learning about human nature depend on the context? Um, speaking of the big messiness that we, that we opened with, um, I, so anyway, I've tried, I've tried to use my screening criteria for replicable findings. A separate issue than replicability, though, to my mind, is what you've raised about um, weird populations, this, the Western educated and industrialized, et cetera, um, and like laboratory experiments where we learn everything we can from 20 year olds taking surveys for pizza. And I don't tend to do research in the laboratory. I am, I have always been out in the wild to the extent that it's possible doing experiments with companies, um, with people who don't necessarily uh, think of themselves as an experiment. They're just going about their daily lives and the organization they interact with is A-B testing different ways to help them make better choices. And then we measure what works. So a huge amount of the data in the book is not done with survey subjects. And that's my taste because I am inherently a bit skeptical of what, um, of it's called external validity in science, sort of like you can ask people survey questions, you're going to get answers that are true, but you won't know how much it matters. 
So it's internally valid to that context, to that survey, but does, is it externally valid, meaning out in the wild, will the same things happen? Will they matter? So I try to run studies and I mostly write about studies that are happening in the wild because I feel confident this is a big enough effect that it shows up in, you know, Google employees or, um, you know, you know, pick the, pick the context or in West Point cadets, um, or uh, actually I, I write about Air Force cadets. I'm thinking of Angela's work on West Point uh, cadets, uh, but, you know, both, she has a similar taste for trying to go out in the wild and I think it's really important to try to study things that we believe are really big. If you mm -hmm. want to make policy recommendations and, and affect lives, that's always been my taste. Sometimes it means I don't learn as much about the basic inner workings of the brain or the mechanism and function and the, their trade-offs there, but the book focuses more on in the wild type findings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the things I love about the narrative style of the book is that you present experiments that went the wrong way based on expectation based on the hypothesis that, um, and I'm, cu I'm curious, what's that? <laughs> it happens a lot. Uh -huh. but, but you know, I don't read about it a lot. It's true. It's true. And, and science, we're um, in science, we're generally incentivized to write a, a paper, a scientific unit of publication, um, as if we knew what would happen all along, even when we're surprised, which I think is actually, you know, it makes the reader, it gives like a, a a clearer narrative, but it confounds and confuses the public understanding of how science really works, which by the way, in the current moment in the coronavirus um, crisis that we've all just lived through, I think has been, we've seen the messiness of science, right? Like the Damascus work, oh wait, yes. And oh, this is the um, vaccine. Are you completely safe from breakthrough infections if you're vaccinated? We think so, oh wait, no, maybe you should mask. And so um, that is just the messiness of science is we have a hypothesis that often doesn't hold, but we tend not to write about it that way. And if I could go back in time to your earlier question, like what are things I would teach kids if I were in charge of the universe? Um, I think another thing we don't teach very well is that science is not normally, you know, a brainstorm, brainstorm, like a light bulb, a test, a confirmation of a hypothesis. It's much less linear than that. Mm. Yeah. And so one of the things I really appreciate about your book as as a practicing coach is that my own biases, lead, you know, something works with somebody or someone smiles when I do something with them. And I'm like, well, that's great. That works. I'm going to do it with everyone. And so having you out there in the wild, in the world, testing things rigorously that I can sort of depend on with a greater degree of confidence um, you know, I find that very helpful. And at the same time, what you, when you talk about these boundary conditions and what are the dependent, you're re we're really telling people, you've got to go out and be the scientist of your own life. I think that's you know, right. Like you, when you, you know, you didn't talk about sort of how hard it is to get to run experiments, but you know, we know there's, there's IRB approval, there's funding, there's recruitment, there's people dropping out. There's people mixing up test tubes. Not that's not in your case, but but you know there's. Yes, like, I thankfully rarely deal with test tubes. <laughs> but like running running an actual experiment where you're going to find out something for the to help the world, is a huge endeavor, and a lot of studies never happen because of, of roadblocks. And yet each of us is an N of one, and what we when we can do the experiment on ourselves, then we, we you know it's 100 percent applicable because it's it's for us. I think that's right. You know, uh, it's a little harder, of course, to learn from N of one, because we often are like, oh, look, this worked for me. But actually, you know, even if you hadn't been drinking skim, skim milk every morning, you would have gotten in better shape from doing the pushups you were doing in the afternoon, but you attributed to the wrong. It was the skim milk. That's why my, you know, that's why my muscles look so good. So, you know, we can make mistakes in an N of one that we wouldn't make with a rigorous scientific study. And yet it is really useful internally to experiment and a big lesson of my work and that I try to make sort of the center point of my book is that I think too often we look for a one size fits all type solutions instead of tailoring solutions to the specific problem we face. And that is very much an N of one type problem, right? Because I can say on average, this tactic helps people exercise more or it helps them save more for retirement. But if it doesn't help you, <laughs> the on average effect is pretty useless. And I think one of the reasons an on average effect might not help you is because your specific barrier to change 
may not match the average barrier, right? Maybe the reason you aren't saving is that you just keep forgetting. And most people don't forget to save. They don't have enough resources or they, um, you know, are, are impulsive about wanting to buy this or that shiny new thing when it comes out instead of setting it aside for the future. But if you're really just having a reminder problem, you need a different tool. So figuring that out for yourself through experimentation, I think adds value. Right. And so, so one, one of the things I love about the book, about your approach, is that you are looking at these human weaknesses. They're almost, you're almost not treating them as weaknesses, but they're just, you know, features. Um, and they become weaknesses, you know, within the, in the context of our lives, of our modern lives. Um, something that made me sad, which is completely not the point of the book, is that, like, in the old days, those would all have been strengths right? Like the, you know, conformity, like everyone else is avoiding that berry. So you don't go eat it. Everyone else is running in that direction. So you don't stop and, you know, you wonder why you just joined the herd or you find something sweet and you eat it because it may be the difference between survival and starvation next week. Um, that there's, there's something a little bit bittersweet about, for me at least, about all these, you know, beautiful human traits that, that we've evolved for success that are now biting us in the ass. <laughs> yes, it is a really interesting aspect. So, so you're sort of making an evolutionary psychology argument, which I should say is not my field, but uh, I certainly believe the, the theory there, right? That um, any of these traits we see that we're stuck with any heuristics and biases, they must've served some function and that allowed them to thrive. And that's why we, you know, even though they're sometimes wrong. They were right on average once upon a time. You know, it may still be that it's right on average to follow some of these heuristics, right? Uh, and that it's really just in this situation where you have a goal that it's wrong. So let me give you a for example of one that bites us, but I actually think is great on average. So I'm not sad about it. And that's laziness. And I, I sort of want to like take that word back, <laughs> mm. <laughs> rebrand it because it's awesome to be lazy and, and like, it's the best feature as a computer scientist. I want to build algorithms that are as lazy as possible. Right. I'm not a computer scientist anymore, but once upon a time <laughs> I did a PhD where I hung out with computer scientists. Um, but right. Like that is a good thing. You want to use as few resources as possible to solve a problem. That's, that's great. And humans do that. And in general, I wouldn't want to change that. Because if we were like wasting all our time optimizing when you need to find a plumber or, um, you know, like to pick the perfect cereal that, that makes you as happy as possible rather than just eating what's on your shelf, like that would be, life would be intolerable. So it's good that we are a little sort of wired to take the path of least resistance to reach our goals. So it's just that um, it can be a barrier to change it, you know, when you have developed a habit or found a path of least resistance, the fact that you're resistant to switching that gets tricky, but on average, I think it's good. So anyway, I just want to push back a little on, isn't it sad that we, that these things that were once so great are now biting us. I actually think they're still in some cases, great. We just have to be smart about understanding when they're helping and when they're hurting. And if they're hurting, how do we, you know, thread the needle so that we can get to a good outcome nonetheless. Mm, yeah, because when I think of, of laziness, I think of lack of you know, physical activity. So in sort of my health field, and that was great because our environment didn't give us a choice, right? You go and you, you, you know, you're lazy, you don't eat. So yeah, we would do the minimum. Now I've got, you know, Grubhub and Uber Eats, and I don't have to do anything. Right. So we just, you know, we like, but the, that the is, I, I do think like it is an advance and it can be an efficiency. Right. And it may, may leave you more free time to do other things that you value, even if also it means you're not like going to the gym as much as would be ideal. So it's like, which of those things I wouldn't, I wouldn't want Grubhub and, and Uber eats to go away. I like those things. It's just, how can we use them in a way that helps us rather than hurting us? Right. Right. Um, so let's let's start by you know diving into the actual um, tools with the one the one that made you famous temptation bundling. <laughs> that's a very generous thing to say. Um, well, that's how I heard of you. It was, a, <laughs> it was a Princeton alumni weekly thing, and I'm like, that's really cool. Oh, thank you. Um, temptation bundling is is a funny one. It's something that I studied because I was I would say it was me search. So when I was a graduate student at um do, you know doing a phd 
I found it really hard at the end of a long day of going to tough classes to motivate myself to go to the gym. And I knew I should do it and it would be good for me in the long run and I'd feel better and my mental health would be better and so on. But, you know, I just wanted to basically curl up on my couch and indulge in entertainment. And on the flip side, I wasn't getting my homework done because all I wanted to do was curl up on the couch and indulge in entertainment. So I have like these multiple problems that are all related to impulsivity and temptation and giving into temptation. And I had sort of a, a brainstorm and I was not the first human to have this. Other people have, been, have done this too. Uh, the brainstorm was, okay, what if I only let myself enjoy this entertainment while I'm, while I'm at the gym exercising? So I found that I could exercise and listen to audiobooks and like lowbrow audiobooks, like think, you know, Hunger Games, Da Vinci Code kind of audiobooks. <laughs> I realize other people can binge watch The Bachelor or The Bachelorette at the gym. That's too much sensory input for me, but that might work better for you. <laughs> anyway, I, I tried this with audiobooks. I wouldn't let myself listen to audiobooks unless I was exercising. I listened to the whole Harry Potter series and many, all the Alex Cross, James Patterson novels in grad school. It was so great. I found that I would come home and I would crave a trip to the gym to find out what happened next in the latest book I was listening to. Time would fly while I was at the gym. I didn't even notice that I was exercising. Sometimes I went too long. And then I came home refreshed, rejuvenated. I'd gotten my sort of break entertainment fix in. I was totally ready to hit the books. And I, I, I was more productive. I was happier. Everything was great. So I ended up calling this temptation bundling. I linked a temptation with a chore to make the chore more alluring only let myself do that thing while I was doing the chore and all these good things happen. And I've now studied it and proven that I am not the only person who benefits from it when we did randomized controlled trials and gave people access to tempting content only at the gym. It helped them exercise significantly more. And, um, and, you know, you can do this not just with exercise, but with other things in life, like only let yourself listen to a favorite podcast while you're, you know, doing laundry or other household cleaning, or only let yourself enjoy a glass of wine while making a fresh meal, only pick up the, your favorite treats at Starbucks on the way to hit the books at the library if you're a student or while responding to emails for work that you need to take care of but are dreading. So there's lots of different ways in life to create these kinds of temptation sandwiches. And it turns impulsivity on its head. We've been talking about these barriers to change. One of them is it's not tempting. It's not instantly gratifying to do the things that are good for us in the long run. And we overweight that instant gratification, but if you can make it instantly gratifying, right? This is really an engineer's solution to the problem. You just sandwich <laughs> the chore with something that's fun. And now actually instant gratification is working for you rather than against you. Right. And, and I love how commonsensical and effective and how it taps into both, you know, both impulsivity and laziness in that it's, and at the same time, I was having all these like moral issues with it. <laughs> Oh no, tell me more. Right. So one of them was like one of my, um, the authors that I was influenced the most by, I was a school teacher for many years and I would read um, Alfie Cohen who wrote a book, uh, Punished by Rewards. And he talked about external motivation, extinguishing internal motivation. And so one of the things I wondered was, so if I'm, if I'm gonna go to the gym to listen to Jim Dale, read Harry Potter, you know, when, when that's over or at some point, like, isn't there a value in learning to love the gym ipso facto for itself without needing the sugar on top? I love that you asked this question. And I, I don't know if you'll love my answer, but I think that that um, philosophy and, and claim that uh, external rewards drive out intrinsic motivation is vastly overblown and the evidence for it is very limited. Oh, cool. um, the, the one place. Yeah. So I, you know, it's like, it's one of these, I sort of, it's an attractive idea. It took off and, and it doesn't seem to be, we're talking about replicability, all that robust. So the really good evidence on this um, that I've seen is in kids doing puzzles and they're either being paid to do them or not. And then after that, they take that as a signal because they weren't really sure is a puzzle fun or is a puzzle um, something I'm doing because I, you know, get a, an extrinsic reward for it. There's confusion. You pay me for it. Okay. I get it. This is something adults want me to do. They're going to reward me for doing. It's not fun. It's, it's a chore. And so that changes the nature of their relationship with the activity. But most things in life where we're not, um, they're not ambiguous. And most of the time we're not a kid learning about a task like exercise, for instance, 
it's not ambiguous why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because it's good for me. Uh, uh-huh. And so there's no risk of that sort of miscalibration coming from some sort of extrinsic incentive. The evidence that there's crowd out when you pay someone is, is almost zero in adults, especially for behaviors like exercise or other things we know we should do. It's the opposite. What we find is when we pay people to do something and then take away the rewards, they actually keep doing it more than if we hadn't paid them in the first place because it helps build habits and there's no signal confusion. Um, There's really interesting research by Oleg Erminsky, who's a professor at the University of Chicago, trying to look at this sort of, I'll call it a tension in the literature between a, a number of laboratory experiments, going back to paying people $20 to take surveys, where they do see some evidence of what you're describing and like all the field data, which really doesn't show it. Like, why would there be that? mix up. And he has a really interesting hypothesis and some data to support it, which is that it may be that in a lab controlled setting, when we pay someone to do something and then take away the rewards and see they stop doing it as much, it's actually just about like exhaustion <laughs> because it's in this really tight time frame. And you like, you know, I'm paying you to push a button or something. You get tired. You're physically exhausted because you did it more than the person who wasn't paid. And then when the pay goes away, you need to like take a moment because your fingers hurting. Uh. And so you do it a little less, but actually if you expand the time frame in lab studies, that effect just goes away because now you're refreshed and you're able to push the button just as hard as anyone else. And um, in the field, we don't have those kinds of weird confounds because we're looking over much longer time scales. So he thinks it's all, any time it's been shown in laboratory studies, maybe just an artifact. And then there's that sort of kids version that may be true and robust, but generally when there's no ambiguity, and its behavior over a long run, I don't think there's good evidence that uh, in extrinsic rewards crowd out intrinsic motivation. Wow. So I should start paying my employees. <laughs> you should. Yes, exactly. There may be a reason that the economy functions really well when we pay people. It's amazing. <laughs> Fascinating. That's, that's really cool. All right. So I'm, I'm going to hit you with another moral objection, Okay. Um, which is that when we temptation bundle, we lose the opportunity to love the thing we hate on its own terms. Maybe it's the same thing and maybe, maybe I'm confused, um, but like um, Dan Ariely has spoken about benign masochism, like this idea that you know, his, his solution to present bias is looking at people who do CrossFit and triathlons and like they learn to love the pain. And this is actually how I started running about five years ago is I was like, this really sucks. And look at me doing something that really sucks. Like I'm a badass. like, wow. Right. So that the, you, you know, turn so- that into a reward itself. For being yeah. Like, yeah. The- yourself on the back for it. Exactly. Yeah. I, I don't think the research supports that as a very good strategy. So a couple of things. So first of all, by the way, I should say Dan Ariely is a temptation bundler. And I did an episode of my podcast, Choiceology, on temptation bundling, and he ended up being a featured story because I didn't know this. He was, you know, long before I did my research, but he has this, he has a, you know, long, he's had a lot of challenges in life due to, if you've read Predictably Irrational, he was a burn victim and went through a lot through, as a result of that, due to a blood transfusion, ended up with a disease that to overcome, he had to take these incredibly painful, um, shots at, and uh, injections. And he figured out a way to make it something that he would do rather than something where he wouldn't comply. He knew it was good for him in the long run. He dreaded it. And he started using a tactic where he loved renting videos. He was a grad student and it was like this huge treat and he would only let himself rent a video and watch it. Uh, anyone that he wanted on days when he was giving himself an injection, he linked them in time. He would carry it around all day, look forward to watching it. And then he'd inject himself with this medicine that caused these awful side effects and pop the video in. So he could look forward to that component of the experience. Mm -hmm. So he was a temptation bundler, used this very tactic to help himself, um, get through this really rough and, um, awful disease and, and, and stick to his medication regimen. Um, and on sort of the idea that learning to love the pain is the way through, I'd say that's sort of like the Nike motto, just do it right. Like find to learn, find ways to learn, to love the pain. There's this really great research by Ayala Fishbach of the university of Chicago and Caitlin Woolley at Cornell that shows most of us think that's what we should do. Like just push through, find the most effective route. And in fact, people persist much longer on difficult goals when they find a way to make the goal pursuit itself fun. But we mostly don't have that insight and don't look for ways to do that. Uh, but it's it's far more effective when um, people are encouraged to do that. They they do persist longer. So you know maybe there's some small fraction of people for whom 
they can make it fun with this like mental gymnastics. But I think um, suggesting that as a prescription for the masses is probably misguided based on the evidence. All right, Milkman two, Jacobson nothing. Third, third point. Um, so this is something like when I run, I love to listen to podcasts and things. And every so often I will accidentally put in a podcast where someone is talking about mindfulness. And I'm like, damn, right? What I should do is just run and be with nature. And, you know, if I'm on, if I'm, if I'm exercising, so obviously there are things you can't bundle, right? You can't bundle, you know, doing your taxes, <laughs> with writing your book. <laughs> there are lots of things you can't bundle. Temptation bundling has a lot of limitations in that sense. Right, but in term, in terms of so there's like a thing, you know, there's a lot of people like the thing I'm going to do with my body, and I don't need my mind. And thinking about kind of that bifurcation. Um, yeah, that's right. And um, I also think making things social is a really important way that often we can make it more enjoyable to do something even when it requires your mind because uh, you know, for, you could do your taxes with your best friend and that might, and, and have some wine while you do it. Well, maybe one, maybe only one glass so that you don't get any of the numbers wrong, but uh, you can find ways to bundle some things um, through making them social, even if they do require mental engagement. And there's research mm -hmm. showing that that kind of combination makes it things more enjoyable and that you'll persist longer too. Gotcha. Gotcha. So what, one more question about uh, temptation bundling, um, which is, like this is this is the thing that you sort of first became known for um, in public press, and I was wondering. If, so you know, there's you've described a lot of robust research, really interesting um, refutations of some other things that I had been believing until ten minutes ago. Um, but it became like as just as a as as part of your career. Is there a way in which you're like, oh, this is my thing? I have to be careful that I don't start defending it beyond it's like, like, you know, just sort of like an ego check, like you being yeah. a sophisticate, knowing that for us, I, I know so many scientists who like their, their early careers are great and then something happens and then they become sort of rigidly dogmatic. And I'm wondering, did you worry about that or think about that? I think it's an excellent point. I think it's always a risk because you know, with any, whether you create a product or a scientific finding and you become associated with it and you identify with it and you start to, you're proud of it. And then um, some threat arises, the obvious, you know, all of everything we know about psychology is you're going to discount all, you know, you're going to exhibit confirmation bias. You're going to say like, no, I was right. And, and I can discount that evidence that's contrary to it. And, um, I think this has particularly been a challenge during the replication crisis for scientists because uh, things they've built careers on, evidence they collected sort of following the rules at the time, because we've learned there were some real flaws in, this, in the methods used in particularly in psychological research, but in other fields as well. They thought it was rock solid. It wasn't. It's so hard to back down from a whole career built studying a thing and you believed it. And so I sympathize very much with that. And certainly I hope that I would have the ability if, if evidence came out that temptation bundling was garbage uh, <laughs> to, to own it and accept it. We've certainly done research that makes me think um, some of the constraints are an important part of it. And I have updated my beliefs there. So we did a, an experiment where we tested whether just telling people um, about temptation bundling um, was enough to help them and giving them a free audiobook at the same time to help them exercise more. And we actually found if you just give them a free audiobook when they've signed up for an exercise program to help them exercise more, that's enough. You don't even need to describe temptation bundling. When we did surveys, it seemed like what happened was that people were able to figure out what to do with a book their gym gave them when they asked for a program uh -huh. to help them exercise more. But, um, but I think in some ways it was a, a threat to the idea that we needed to teach this tool. Um, and I don't know that I responded to it as, as perfectly as I would love to. It, it's a hard thing about science. I think it also is one of the reasons that I feel lucky that my career has looked at a really wide range of different tools and tactics, as opposed to a single one that I've studied many, many different topics. So hopefully that also provides some insurance against becoming too wedded to any one finding, but you know, it's just a really, it's a hard part of being a person who is entrepreneurial in any way, because 
sometimes the things that you get invested in don't work out and you have to, it's hard to decouple your identity from that. So I don't, I don't think I've solved it, but those are some thoughts. Gotcha. I mean, it occurs to me that one of the things that can help you is that you're doing very sort of public research projects that are trying to solve problems and you're measuring them very objectively. So like you had an idea about um, how it help, how to language to help people get vaccinated. Right. Right. Maybe, maybe just, right. And we tested that. it and some of it, some of the things we thought would work really didn't. And some things really did. And so that was exciting. And, and we, you know, let go of our um, misconceptions, hopefully quickly or faster when we have science and data, but that doesn't mean completely. Um, yeah. So this was research. We started, my team started doing last spring when everybody was talking about, obviously the pandemic had just begun really. And we were all thinking, how are we going to get out of this? And vaccines looked like the, the solution. I still completely bought into that as a solution, but as we looked Forward, we forecast the future. We thought, okay, everybody's focusing on let's, you know, developing the vaccines. Good. I'm glad they are. I can't help with that. Um, there's getting, there was some focus coming around the bend on how are we going to scale up distribution? That's good. I can't help with that. But no one was talking about how will we deal with the issue that often when a new technology like this arises, there's not a hundred percent take up. And so we thought maybe that's where we can help. We actually have studied this before with flu vaccines and how do you nudge people towards making better decisions about taking these life-saving vaccines. Uh, we thought we could get out ahead of it. And so we designed two massive experiments that we call the mega studies where we had about 150 different scientists. We tapped them on the shoulder and said, what do you think the best messages would be if we wanted to remind people to get a vaccine and, and we're going to test it on flu vaccines, but we actually really want the message to work for COVID. That's what we're aiming at. So give us something that you think could be redeployed. Mm -hmm. um, and about 75 of those 150 came back with ideas. We winnowed it down to a few dozen and we partnered it's, with- It's like March Madness. Huh? It, it was sort of like, a, yeah, it was a tournament, uh, exactly like March Madness. And we um, partnered with Walmart pharmacies and also with two local health systems, Penn Medicine and Geisinger Health. And we deployed uh, hundreds of thousands of messages experimentally just, and then measured who gets a flu vaccine. That was our outcome. Cause again, COVID vaccines weren't ready yet. And we wanted to know before they were what would be best. Um, so we text messaged people and said, you know, go get a flu vaccine at your Walmart pharmacy or get a vaccine. When you go see your doctor and your upcoming appointment, what we found testing all these different tactics from like telling you a joke about the flu, you know, have you heard the one about the flu? Don't spread it around. Um, or, uh, telling you everybody else is getting one or do it for your neighbors to protect them as opposed to protect yourself. Or you want to firmly commit. Can you type? I commit to get a vaccine tested all these different tactics. And one rose to the top in every environment, which was actually kind of amazing because it's a really different decision to get in your car, drive to the pharmacy, ask for a flu shot, than to walk into your doctor's office for a healthy visit, be offered one and say, yes, I'll take it. Those are really different actually. But we saw the same thing worked in urban settings and rural settings in pharmacy settings and doctor's offices. And that was telling people simply, this vaccine has been reserved for you or it's waiting for you um, in a, a simple reminder text message. We think that was so effective that we aren't sure. Cause again, we weren't like tapping people and surveying then we were testing this in the wild, but our suspicion is it worked so well um, in part because it conveys that it's recommended or else why would your doctor or pharmacy be telling you they've reserved it? So they're saying like this, we endorse this, right? Um, it sounds like maybe it'll be less of a hassle because it's already set aside for you. Um, maybe it implies other people are getting it. That's why it's recommended. And um, finally, there's something called the endowment effect where once something belongs to me, I actually value it more. This is some of the research that Nobel laureate Richard Thaler did that helped win him the Nobel prize in 2017 in economics. So we think that that endowment effect may also be propelling people like, oh, it's my vaccine. I don't want someone else to take the one that's yeah. reserved for me. I like that. So all that stuff we suspect, plus of course the reminder itself, cause we're forgetful and recognizing, oh, here's a, you know, I can go get it in this way and I should get it in this way. Uh, we suspect that's why this rose to the top of everything we tested. Hmm. So, so sort of like those um, gift shops that have the the rack of spinning uh, like keychains with people's names on them. Like, oh, there's my name. Yeah, that's an interesting um, an interesting <laughs> analogy. Like, and and yeah, maybe it's a sim similar psychology that you want that thing that feels like it belongs to you already. Interesting. Hmm. So, can you reveal which social scientist came up with that one? 
Um, yes, I can. So Gretchen Chapman of um, Carnegie Mellon University and Allison Buttenheim of the University of Pennsylvania actually very specifically developed a test of reserved for you language. But interestingly, um, a number of other scientific teams just included that language in tests of other ideas and theirs then shot to the top too. So it was really an agglomeration um, of dozens of messages where we looked and said all the ones that happened to have that ingredient were the best rather than the specific one designed by the team interested in this question. Cool. What suddenly comes to me is, and I don't think I realized it until just now, is there's a lot of women in your book. And it's, you know, like, I was so happy that you included Ellen Langer, whom to me is like, you know, the, the Babe Ruth of, of social science, like the things she has done, and yet nobody knows about her. And she has, I mean, in the, in the wider world, like people don't. She's certainly and, a hero of mine, yes. Yeah, and, and you know, Aliyah Crum working with her and you and, and the, um, these other women you just mentioned, like there's, um, I'm not there are sure a lot of men in my book too, but there are also a lot of women. <laughs> there are, but there are, it's, it's like, um, I don't know. There's a lot I, of scientists in my book is another, uh, I think one of the things that was really important to me in writing it was, um, to highlight the adventure stories of mm. discover the discoveries, because at least, you know, look, I wrote a book that appeals to my interests. <laughs> for obvious reasons. And to me, the magic of science is partly the adventure of getting to an answer. So the book tries to tell those stories, but I certainly couldn't tell, I don't have enough interesting insights to tell a whole, you know, to write a whole book about. So there's, I tried to bring in some of the insights and stories of the discoveries from the people I most admire. And it was important to me that that was a, a diverse and representative group of people. And I do think there's tons of brilliant women doing important work in this area, as well as tons of brilliant men. Um, and so it was a yeah, pleasure I, to get to share their stories. Yeah, and I'm not, you know, I think it's the reason that I'm, I'm highlighting the fact there are so many women uh, scientists presented in the book is that it really is a level of, of inclusion that I haven't, I don't always see. Um, that, that, I don't, you know, so I don't know if there are, you know, sex differences and how people approach problems, but just, just knowing that, first of all, that girls could look at this book and say, oh, this is a career for me. I love that you got that from it. And I will admit that one of my secret hidden um, desires in writing this book was to communicate that. So I love that you um, saw it. And I do think, you know, I remember reading books when I was younger, like Freakonomics, um, which Anyway, I love both of the authors of Freakonomics and it's a fantastic book and thinking I want to do these kinds of exciting studies. But then when I look at the kind of, or, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's books and I wanted to see more done by women and written by women. And so it was part of the reason I chose to write a book in the first place. So anyway, I'm glad that you noticed that a message of the book cool. deep, buried deep is women who yeah. do this and do it really well and, and make advances. And I just want to say like, there are tons of amazing women in the book from Yana Gallus of UCLA to Ellen Langer of Harvard, as you mentioned, and Aliyah Crum of Stanford and uh, Ayelet Fishbach of the University of Chicago, just, and lots of junior scholars that I wanted to highlight as well. Um, but also lots of great men. And I'm, I, you know, I think our field, it still leans male because it's an, you know, anyway, that's just the nature of the academy right now but that's changing in the younger generations and it's really exciting to see. Do you think there are fewer barriers to uh, women rising to the top of the profession in sort of behavioral science than there might be in, you know, engineering and like just, just because there's, you know, more sophistication around, oh, ch let me check my bias. Of course I have biases and let me make sure I don't pr mm. I'll proliferate them. That's interesting. So I, now I'm going to tell you about my, personal life. Um, my husband is a physicist and we talk about this a lot. And actually when I'm not studying behavior change around things like health and um, finances, I actually do study race and gender bias in part because it was so in my face in graduate school as an engineering and business PhD student that there was this huge representation gap that, you know, once you get to the higher levels in academia, I was like, whoa. <laughs> If I'm going to study the world and things that I think matter, this should be in my portfolio. So I have, have done some research on this and I talk about it a lot with my husband. Interestingly, I actually 
feel like there's, um, there's more discussion in the hard sciences right now about bias than in some of the behavioral sciences, maybe because it's just assumed, it's assumed that we know already, because, you know, how could you get through graduate school in, in a behavioral science without knowing it, but it feels more visible um, and more like there's a concerted effort being made in other fields, honestly. And if I were to guess what, you know, what makes the numbers sticky in harder science is like, you know, the numbers are staying a little lower though, by the way, it's pretty bad in business academia too, but I would guess it's not so much about knowledge of bias. And also I'm very skeptical that just telling people they're biased has much effect. And I've done studies trying to figure out if that works and we haven't had much success. Hmm. Uh, I, I think role models are important. So I think, you know, like being able to, and it's part of, we just talked about in the book, part of the reason I felt like trying to make visible these women is important. Um, there's not as many role models in these other fields. Uh, so I think that that is part of it. I think um, being told throughout your life, what you can achieve and what path, you know, not, not only literally like a teacher tells you, yeah, you can take advanced placement physics and you can't, and maybe their decision is biased by what they expect of women, but also what you, you know, all the stereotypes you imbibe. <laughs> I think those things probably unfortunately matter than just an, more than an awareness of bias. Mm -hmm. I know you, you, you mentioned Claude Steele in the book, whose who's work on sort of that, uh, you know, the bias that stereotype we Stereotype threat, yeah. Stereotype threat and, you know, like, like Whistling Vivaldi was just a, an eye-opening book for me. I know I was, you know, we're almost at the end of the hour and we, I, I haven't like really dived into, the, people just buy the book, you, the, <laughs> all that stuff. I'm just, I'm just curious, like, does it frustrate you knowing that there are science answers to be had to some of these, like, we're in a time right now around racial bias, gender bias, from looking at just what's happened from the Olympics, from the, you know, George Floyd, Black Lives Matter. And the discussions are so, they feel to me, so untethered to fact. Like, mm. does white fragility training work isn't a question that is even, you're allowed to ask. It's like, you know, is it the right thing? And yet you you know, you approach things, well, well, let's see, you know, let's see what actually moves the needle. And I'm curious, you know, are, are there, um, are there efforts to get to facts here so that we're not just screaming at each other across the divide? So I would, I would say I'm not frustrated. Um, I'm pleased that we're having the conversations we're having and there is really good science going on in the background, which, um, and I think more and more of it as there's more attention to these issues, um, I'll point listeners to one book I particularly love by Dolly Chug, who's a collaborator and friend called um, The Person You Mean to Be. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really about the science and what it shows can work in terms of changing behaviors um, around bias and supporting members of other groups. And there, there's tons of great science being done on this. We'll know more. We already know a lot. And I do think there's a lot of people who are a part of the dialogue who are aware of that work and are in trying to incorporate it and, and it's just growing. So it's been exciting to see a snowball of momentum in that research area in the last year and a half. I've, you know, I've been working in this area for a decade. Again, it's sort of like a side area, but actually all my doctoral students study this and it, there's just been a huge growth in interest and funding and opportunities. And I think that's wonderful. Mm. Cool. Um, yeah, because it's, you know, from 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 my layperson's perspective, all I'm hearing about is that, you know, the academy is is walking on eggshells afraid to say anything because you'll get canceled if you say anything that's not, you know. I don't think that's true. I think there's a lot of people who are speaking up and have great science. And I'll just, I mentioned Dolly, but um, Jennifer Richardson at Yale, um, is another scholar who I think has just amazing work that's been getting a lot of attention of late on this. Um, th there's so many more. I'm like, I could just start listing names. Maybe I'll send you an email afterwards and you can put some links in the uh, oh, show that. notes for, Great. for Great. listeners if they're interested in, in some other recommendations that are science-based, but there's a lot out there. Gotcha. 
Uh, I want I want to end with a a question for gosh, there's so many <laughs> I didn't uh, get to, but you you talk about um, conformity as a, you know a potentially positive trait if we conform to the right things, and you talked about the copy and paste strategy of you know your um, the person who hung out with vegetarians her freshman year and sort of became a vegetarian just sort of by observation and osmosis. I'm curious to so many people are now like in the lifestyle movement are, are YouTubers, TikTokers, Instagrammers. And, but I think we can watch what they do like we would watch, you know, Emerald, just sort of sitting back and being entertained as opposed to adopting. Do you have any thoughts on for influencers about how to start creating content that stimulates change and not just, just gets eyeballs? Not just entertainment. Yeah, it's interesting because the incentives, of course, are, you know, how do I make this go viral? Um, and so you've got to attend to that, too, because if you don't have a wide reach, you're not going to change anyone. But you also, if you want to propel change, you want to be providing the kinds of tools that are most useful. I think the more that um, when you're exhibiting a behavior, if you're an influencer and, you, and you'd like to see others adopt it, the more you can make it feel accessible. Like this isn't just something I can do because I have, you know, a million followers and a bag of money. <laughs> Here's how a, a person, like how other people who um, have more normal lives and might share your profile have deployed it. So bringing in more stories of, of more relatable people, how they're doing it. And then I think pointing out that it's powerful to literally try to cut and paste. And that's one of the things we showed in a study. If you tell people, try to watch the people who are doing well at this goal you have very deliberately and see what are their, what are their hacks and then try to copy them even though some of it gets picked up naturally by osmosis, we found that people, when they were given that trick, like go watch and copy on purpose, they're like, oh yeah, and they got further. And so um, encouraging that kind of deliberate emulation can be really helpful. Awesome, so thank you. Well, thank you so much. This, the book, How to Change is fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm changing my practice. I already did a couple of sessions with people just pushing them to how do you make this fun? And like that question, first of all, was just so liberating that they felt like, oh, this can be like, this is such serious stuff. Like I bet, you know, I can't be not serious about it or else I'm betraying something. It's like, yeah, you know, go have fun. So, so it's already imp impacting my own practice in a really great way. Um, I'm curious how people can follow you, stay in touch with you. I know you have a podcast, you have a website. so. If people, people want more Katie Milkman, what do they do? Uh, oh, thank you. Well, as you said, I hope, I hope they'll read how to change. Um, my website is katiemilkman.com and it's Katie with a Y, like Katie Perry, which throws everyone off, but thank goodness for a pop star who spells her name the same way I do to help. Um, and you know, there's links to my research. There's uh, links to my podcast traceology, which you can also find on any podcasting app and, uh, you know, I hope there's a newsletter milkman delivers. You can even sign up for, if you're really excited about behavioral science and want to hear from me once a month with interviews, I do as scientists. So I hope that's a helpful resource. And I really appreciate the chance to come on your show and chat. Your questions were just fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and the, the spirit at which, with which you're doing research and sharing it for, for the global betterment of all. And it was just so much fun talking with you. I, I, I just, love laughing together with you. It was fantastic. Oh, thank you. Likewise. And, and good luck with your book. I'm really excited to get a copy. Oh, don't, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be on its way. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.